So I want to start by asking all of you a question. Do you think we are generous? Do you think when we help each other, we're doing it out of the goodness of our hearts? Or do you think when people help each other, they're doing it because they expect to get something in return? Maybe not right away, but they expect that they'll get something back for it. Now, today, I want to try to convince all of you that generosity, that doing things because of the need of others is actually fundamental to who we are, and that it's also fundamental to what we are, to what we're made of, to the very fabric of our cellular beings. And generosity can not just help us understand ourselves as social entities, but also as biological entities. So I'm going to start with the definition. Generosity is giving that is considerate of the needs of others. So this definition of generosity precludes no, you can't expect to get paid back if you're truly being generous under this definition of generosity. You're being generous because you see that others have needs and that you're able to help. One great example, of course, is parents taking care of children. When we take care of our children, we don't do it because we expect to get something back. In fact, we're usually pretty sure that they're not going to appreciate it at all. Um, but we do it because we see the need, we love them, we care for them. And this parenting, par parent caretaking, and in general taking care of our kin and those around us, is an example of helping based on need. Um, it's what we call a need-based transfer. Um, and need-based transfers are instances of sharing, cooperation, of helping, where individuals give based on the need of others. And we see across many societies and in many different contexts that need-based transfers are often characterized by these two criteria. So in a system of generosity, like need-based transfers, individuals ask only when they're in need, and they give if they're asked and able. Now, these conditions don't always apply, and if you recall the last slide of the parent and offspring, we know that children often ask even when they're not in need. But <laughs> as an as a overall rule, when we look at need-based transfers, they, they tend to fit this pattern of asking when you're in need and giving if you're asked and you're able to help. Another important part of need-based transfers is that they're given without an expectation of return. Now, this doesn't mean that it won't, in the end, be good for you somehow, because it, it may very well be. But the reason for doing it, the motivation inside the individual, is not that they're expecting to get something back. Rather, the motivation is that they see a need and they're responding to it. Now, need-based transfers are the centerpiece of the Human Generosity Project. This is a transdisciplinary project um, that incorporates work at eight field sites around the world, which you see up here on the map, and also experiments in the lab looking at human behavior, where individuals have opportunities to help each other, and computer modeling to look at what are the conditions where generosity thrives and where generosity can actually potentially outperform uh, approaches to giving where you're expecting to get something back in return. Let's take a deeper look at one of the societies that we're studying as part of the Human Generosity Project. The Maasai of, of East Africa are pastoralists. They have herds. Um, being a pastoralist means that you're relying on your livestock for your uh, livelihood, and your well-being. And um, the Maasai have large herds, and they care for them and rely on them for food, um, for milk, for meat. They're in the Great Rift Valley of um, East Africa. So they're over here somewhere. And this is what the Great Rift Valley looks like. It's gorgeous, beautiful. Um, it's also very variable. The ecology has um, many different uh, areas that have different features. So in the mountains, it's often greener. In the valleys, it's drier. And on a year-to-year -year basis, 
there's a lot of variation as well because they have two rainy seasons and two dry seasons every year. So depending where you are exactly and what time of year it is, you might have enough uh, vegetation for your livestock to be happy and healthy, or you might not. So it's a challenging way to make a living to keep all of your cattle always well fed. Now, the Messiah, the Messiah are pastoralists, which means that they depend on their livestock, and, and that's really what being a pastoralist means. So I want to ask all of you guys, now given what you know about the Messiah, we can extend this a little bit more broadly to thinking about being a pastoralist in East Africa, where you have uh, this variability in the Great Rift Valley in terms of space and time in the availability of resources. So do you think you could survive in East Africa as a pastoralist? Could you survive those challenges? So I want you to all imagine that you have just been asked to participate in a brand new reality show called Pastoral and Prepared. And as part of this reality show, you will be landed down in the Great Rift Valley and given 70 cows to start with. Now, you need to stay over 64 cows to support your family and to survive. So our new survivalist approach is pastoral. Now, you need to keep your cows safe and healthy. Make sure they have water. Make sure they have enough vegetation to eat so that they can all survive. And you have to deal with risks because of the uncertainties of this environment. There may be a drought. Your cattle or other livestock may get a disease. And there's also a problem of theft. So someone from a neighboring group may come and steal some of your cattle at night. So you'll have to construct enclosures to keep your cattle um, protected at night. You'll have to uh, engage in animal care to keep them free of disease. And you'll have to make some wise decisions about where you take your animals so that they can be hydrated and well fed. Now, you have a partner also. This partner is also given 70 cows. So you and your partner are both facing these same challenges. You've both been put down in East Africa. Now, how will you and your partner survive? Um, what skills do you need? What strategy will you take? Now, first of all, I would suggest that you and your partner don't stay together. Now, why is that? Well, if you stay together, then if it's, you're both in an area that on that particular month has bad rainfall, then you both won't survive, and you won't be able to ask each other for any help. So first thing you should do, split up a little bit. Now, next, what skills do you need? How can you survive well in this environment? So a couple things, a couple basic skills could help you out. Being a decent herder, being able to keep the animals together, move them along to greener pastures. Uh, milking, that would be good. That would uh, help you to get the milk from the cows that you need for yourself and your family by your building, and being able to protect yourself from uh, wild animals and um, potentially from other humans if there's raiders. Now, all of those things together would give you a pastoralist survival rating, or PSR, that was still, you know, in the sort of low intermediate category. Um, if you really want to enhance your PSR, you're going to need to have some better strategies for dealing with the risks and uncertainties of that ecology. And then you can move up a little bit in your PSR. So what would you use? Well, if you were Maasai, if you knew what the Maasai were doing, you would see that they use something called osotwa to deal with these risks. What is osotwa? Osotwa is a central, important part of Maasai culture. It's a cultural institution. It's also quasi-religious for them. Um, and osotwa is basically a norm of need-based transfers. Individuals who follow osotwa 
ask for help from their partner only if they're in need, and they give if they're asked and able. So if a Maasai herder drops below the number of cows he needs to support his family, he can ask a neighbor, an Osotwa partner, for enough cows to stay at that level that he needs to survive and for his family to survive. And on the other hand, if you're asked and you have enough cows to help, then you give. So this is how the Maasai solved this problem of managing the risks and uncertainties of the environment. Now, if we look at what the word osotwa means, it actually is the same word as umbilical cord. So the way that the Maasai conceptualize the osotwa relationship is of a relationship of giving based on need. And it echoes this idea of parents taking care of their children simply because they care for their well-being. Also, osotwa explicitly is not about getting a return. The Maasai have a separate system of debt and credit, so they will make loans to each other and expect to get returned. But any requests that are made within the osotwa framework it's not expected that those gifts will be paid back. Now, Osotwa is just one example of a need-based transfer strategy that we see across societies. As our work in the Human Generosity Project is progressing, we're discovering that many societies around the world have norms of need-based transfers. The Maasai have Osotwa and Many of the other societies that we're studying have similar systems where individuals will ask only if they're in need and they'll give if they're asked and able. So need-based transfers go by many different names, but we do see these similarities across cultures. Now, I've told you a little bit about need-based transfers in the context of pastoralism. Some of the other societies that we're looking at are hunter-gatherers, so they are basically on a day-to-day -day basis going out and gathering food and hunting and sharing. But what about large-scale societies and market-driven societies? Do we see need-based transfers operating there? And do these need-based transfer norms like Osotwa translate to our modern large-scale market-driven society? Well we decided to take Osotwa and bring it to New Jersey to see how well undergraduates at Rutgers can take up the norms of Osotwa. So how generous were um, these uh, Rutgers students in the lab? Well, we had them read about Osotwa and, um, or not read about Osotwa, or we had them read about need-based transfers among Western uh, ranchers, in, uh, ranchers in the American West who also help each other based on need. So there was a sort of culturally familiar version of need-based transfers. There's the OSA 12 version of need-based transfers. And then there was no, um, there was a control where they read nothing. And then we had them play a game where they had to manage resources. They had to keep above a certain level in order to be viable. Um, and they had risks and uh, disasters occur occasionally. And then we let them ask a partner for help. And we were interested in whether we would see more need-based giving and less account-keeping, tit-for-tat kind of behavior when people read about Osotwa or when they read about need-based transfers um, in the American West. And what we found was that both the Osotwa condition and the rancher need-based transfer condition led to more overall giving, larger requests being made, um, unconditional giving and unconditional asking, meaning that individuals were asking for help two, three, four times in a row, or um, giving help several times in a row without getting paid back in between. 
we also saw less matching of the amounts that individuals gave and received overall. So what this tells us is uh, basically a little bit of OSOTWA goes a long way to making people need-based transfer. Now you might be wondering, well, why be generous? Isn't being generous really, in the end, you're just giving and you're not getting anything back for it? So, so why would it exist? Um, and evolutionarily speaking, why would it exist if it's just costly, if you're just giving of yourself? Why would that be there? Well, there are a lot of different reasons, but um, one of those reasons is, of course, uh, the help in managing risks. And we can look in a little bit more depth at this question by constructing computer models of different strategies and see how they perform in different environments. So why are people generous? Well, they're generous because on some level it works, right? Being generous works. Now, what does it, what does it do for you? Well, oops, sorry. There we go. So we constructed a model to look at who survives when individuals, agents in the model, are placed in the same kind of world that I just described to you, where you have herds and you have to keep your herds above 64 cattle, um, and there's drought, there's disease, disasters can occur, and you have a partner, and you can ask that partner for help. So who survives in this? Do the agents that don't share with each other at all survive? Do the agents that are using OSOTWA, need-based transfers, survive best? Or do agents that are doing account keeping, where if they give, they expect to get paid back, and if they don't, then they never give again? Well, what we found is that when there were no transfers, that the percentage of herds surviving at 50 years was pretty clearly under 25%. Once you move to using account keeping, so giving loans basically, you get a little bump in survival, so you're around 25% of the herd survive. But if you use a need-based transfer rule, then almost 30% of herds survive. So this is a pretty big survival difference um, for being more generous. Now, we can ask, well, how, what happens? when you go from just a little bit of risk to a lot of risk. So here we have the safe zone. This is in the green. In the green, there really aren't risks. Shocks, disasters, that doesn't really occur. This is the safe area. No, no problems in the safe area. Now, once you start moving out into the yellow, there are some risks. The likelihood of a disaster is more is higher, and the severity of those disasters is higher. And then we have the dead zone. Now, the dead zone is just what it sounds like. Uh, the dead zone is a place where no matter what you do, you really won't be able to survive because it's so harsh. Um, the disasters are so frequent and so severe that there really is no hope of surviving there. Um, now, we can ask, well, what is it that makes individuals able to survive better in this risk zone? Um, what is it that makes some individuals more likely to be outliers in their risk taking? Well, one way of dealing with risk, as we've seen, is to share, is to help. And we can do that either with expecting a return or generously. So let's look at what happens in a computer model when we increase the severity of the disasters. So when we move from the safe zone into this risk zone, who survives better? So down here, I have the green zone, the yellow zone, and the red zone. You can see in the green zone, herds are surviving for a really, really long time. In the red zone, nobody survives. But the interesting action, of course, is happening in the yellow here, where the 
individuals that are using need-based transfer strategies have consistently higher uh, likelihood of surviving or a greater length of survival of their herds than the individuals that are using account keeping. So here, generosity is paying off in terms of herd survival and allowing these pairs to survive in much riskier environments than they could if they were just giving each other loans and paying them back. Now, this benefit from teaming up and being generous, giving based on need, is not unique to human societies. In fact, it may be important for the evolution of social behavior and cooperation much more generally. If we look across life, we see many examples of need-based transfers. We see vampire bats that feed the most hungry bats. We see social insects who transfer, regurgitate food for their nestmates. And all of these fit with our definition of generosity, that the giving is based on the need of the recipient. Now, generosity is not just for animals. Generosity is also for cells. So the evolution of multicellularity is partly a transition from cells that were going it alone, sort of every cell for himself, to cells that clustered and formed groups where they cooperated in order to get benefits at that higher level of the group. And in fact, when we look at cells, what we see is that multicellular bodies are made of cells that are constantly transferring nutrients and uh, oxygen to each other. And if you imagine for a minute the evolution of multicellularity from single cell to multicellular, initially you have single cells that get everything they need from the environment. And if they don't, um, then they don't survive. But once you start having clusters of cells, um, they can manage risk, share some of that risk. And also, once you get to a certain point, you have cells on the inside that can't actually get resources directly from the environment because they can't get there through diffusion. So what this means is in order to get bigger, multicellularity had to evolve need-based transfer systems at the cellular level. Now, to me, what all of this means is that Generosity is the basis for complex multicellular life itself. So now when I think about generosity, I don't think just of generosity as a social phenomenon. I think of it as truly a biological phenomenon. Every one of our cells as generous. So really, if you look inside yourself, what you see is generosity times 30 trillion. It's approximately the number of cells that we have in our bodies. All of us sitting here today are generosity incarnate. Thank you.